Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for an episode of the Cosmopolite Collective. I am here, Diana Lordson, with a very special guest and longtime friend of mine, for a friend of mine for over 20 years, Dr. Raman Sani, who is a clinical psychologist and female entrepreneur in Glendale, Arizona, who recently just started her own practice, Aura Psychological Services, that provides high quality mental health care services to children, adolescents, and adults. So we're here to talk about mental health and all things related to that. So Raman, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for having me, Diana. It's exciting to be of here. Of course. <laughs> I'm excited. So first of all, congratulations on starting your own clinic. I'm thank so you. proud of you. I know this has been a long time coming and it's been a lot of work. Um, but before we dive into learning about your clinic and all of the amazing things that you're doing right now, I want to start off by letting the audience get a chance to get to know you a little bit better. So there's no better way to do that than to talk about travel. So you are a very well-traveled person. You have traveled all around the world. I want to hear about some of your favorite travel memories. Are there any that stand out? Yes, I have been fortunate enough to travel around the world. Um, my dad loves to travel, so that's why. Um, Let's see, some memories that stand out. I would say Brazil, Rio for New Year's on the beach with like 2,000 people. That was fantastic. Um, yeah. Last year was amazing. Went to Egypt. Um, and mm. that was that was very awesome. Um, I meditated by the Pyramid of Giza, which is known to be wow. uh, one of the largest, most powerful vortices. So that was awesome. Um but I would probably say my favorite travel experience was South Africa and mm, okay. going on safari. That was Why was that your favorite? That was my favorite because I think I learned just by just by going on safari and being in that environment, I learned so many valuable lessons. I think the biggest lesson was about respect. You respect mm. the animals and they respect you, you know, and it's just, it's just don't mess with them. You know what I mean? And they won't mess with you. And did it, you have any close encounters? Not at all. Because like, oh. you know, we, you drive, you drive, we're in a, you know, you're in a Hummer thing and you kind of drive around and though they're used to the Hummer, um, you know, you're not supposed to stand up or like do, you know, anything crazy, but, um, but it's just really interesting. It's just kind of like they see you, you see them, and it's like that respect, you know? I see you, you see me, and there's and and I'm I'm not doing anything to mess with your territory and you're not doing anything to mess with mine. So it's just it's just that really it's a humbling experience and it just carried forth with me. And so that would probably be my favorite one. And a good life lesson. Don't mess with me, I won't mess with you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so out of your, your travel experiences, you kind of touched on this a little bit um, with South Africa, but are there any particular experiences that really influenced your philosophy on life? Well, I would say it would, it would be that one, it, um, mm -hmm. just because the whole value, the whole value of respect, yes, you know what respect means, but again, just kind of going into, bringing it into the real world when you come back here it the same applies for for the same applies with humans, you know. The same applies mm -hmm. for with everyday interactions with people. Um, same applies with my what patients or whether it's um, colleagues or parents or family, anything. It's it's a matter of treating everyone with the kind of respect that you would want to be treated with. And again, it was just and to be humble, you know, to be humble about it. And so. That again, that that's what I took, and I took that from South Africa, and that was just it was uh, still to this day the best, the best. And respecting boundaries, obviously. So great, great yeah. life lesson there. And you mentioned your dad that you travel a lot because your dad likes to travel, um, and I know your parents are immigrants. How has that shaped? Obviously, it's shaped you 
um, in the fact that you love to travel and that you've gotten a lot out of travel, but how has that shaped your perspective and your drive to succeed? So my dad went to med school in India. Uh, My parents got married in India before they moved to Sacramento. And then I was born a year later in Sacramento. Um, And so he then did his residency in Detroit, um, fellowship in LA, and then we moved to uh, Arizona. And I think just the values that they instilled, particularly of education and knowledge. So my dad's biggest value is education and knowledge is powerful. Uh, The more you know, the more you can do. So it was always pushed. Uh, There was no option for, what do you mean you might go to college? (laughs) That was, you're going (laughs) and you're going to graduate school. Um, And the biggest thing, I think that the most, the most influential thing my dad ever said was, you know, whatever you do, just be the best at it. So I think that, and he um, is, he has a huge successful oncology practice here now, and I've seen the hard work he put in. And so it just, it's, that's respect. Like I, I, I would love to be able to do that someday and grow Aura the way he did, uh, grew his practice. So, and I'm just laughing because I remember when we were in college and if we would have dinner with your parents, he was always grilling us about our classes and our grades and what we were doing and how much money do you think you're going to make an hour if you do this or that or, or you know, what do you think you're going to do with that? And so I always felt kind of that pressure where he made me want to make sure that I succeeded as well. He definitely gives off that vibe. So oh, absolutely. I can only imagine as his daughter. Oh, absolutely. I remember him saying that. I remember you. I remember us having that conversation with you with you there. And I was like, yeah, that's my dad. Don't be scared. We made sure we had our answers prepared before dinner. So uh, we, we knew we knew what was coming. So exactly. Exactly. You can't believe it. It's still the same. <laughs> Yes, that's great. And and I, I miss your mom, too. And I miss the amazing Indian food that she used to make when I used to visit you for fall break or spring break during college. Well, well your so, mom makes the best Indian food. Well, thank you. She she actually really does. And, you know, I, ta- I talked about my dad, but my mom is his right hand woman. Uh, he mm-hmm. wouldn't be where he is and what he's done without her. And the fit and she's the backbone to the family uh she's for all of us and she continues to be um she's actually i would say one of my best friends actually both parents are one of my best friends which is really interesting um you know just you know you know me the way you know i was yes i was kind of i was raised so my parents coming from india i came home to uh an indian household yet i go to school and i have the western world around me so then balancing and learning how to navigate the two. It took a long time. Um, I'm the oldest of three siblings, so I didn't have somebody to show me the way. Um, so it was developing. There's some pressure that comes with that. There is, right. Well, I mean, I was a little bit of the rubber <laughs> child, so I kind of just did it, you know, and then got in trouble, but that's okay. <laughs> um, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, but, you know, ultimately developing what we would now call bicultural identity, you know, I'm, Indian and I am American. And then that ended up being my um, focus of my dissertation, actually. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to read that one day. Maybe we'll do an episode of you uh, reading through your dissertation. That'll be fun. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I, I (laughs) I developed a program actually for adolescent and I kept it I kept it to Indian, not Asian, because that would just require way too much more writing. Um, but developed mm-hmm. a program uh, for adolescent um, Indian f- females and communication skills and developing those skills to learn how to communicate with their parents and their parents learning how to communicate with them so they can learn how to develop that balance, um, which you still see today. You know, um, you know when uh, a lot of my a lot of a lot of people still coming here face the same kinds of issues. You know, you want to go out and do this and your parents are like, uh, no, you're going to stay home. <laughs> you can't go next door. And so it's just kind of like learning how to balance that, but it's about communication. So, yeah. And it's, it's interesting. One of the things that I always remember is how proud you are of your Indian heritage and how much of that rubbed off on me. 
So when I would visit you, you introduced me to the whole Bollywood world. I mean, from the Indian dancing, the the music, Dave Das was like transformative in my life because that movie and the dancing and the music is just amazing um, in so many other movies. And I remember just going to your house and just watching Bollywood movies like back to back to back. Yeah. Um, and it was just the henna on my hands, like, and on my feet, like just so many different experiences I have in addition to the food. I mean, you just exposed me to this whole other world that I hadn't been exposed to before. And that was one of the coolest things I've always taken from our friendship was just that exposure. And now I feel so in the know about things just because of the time that I've spent with you and your family. I know there's obviously a lot more for me to learn, but just that that insight into your culture was just, I think, groundbreaking for me as a person. Um, I learned so much about the values. You mentioned, you know, education being one, but there were so many other ones. I remember, you know, uh, one of your family members had a birthday and we went and we um, went to a homeless shelter and, and served food. You know, it's even though your family has done very well for themselves there, you know, you talked about being humble, that humility is still very present in in your parents, in your siblings, in in you, and just the way that you all conduct yourselves. So I thought that was just such a, a really cool thing that was really touching for me to view um, view from your family. So I always I appreciate that about you for for bringing me into that world. Of course, um, I remember I remember all of that. I remember you know you coming in us us, us watching Dave's ass on the dances over and over again. Yes, it was awesome. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I, I do, I love, I love being Indian. I love my culture. I love that I can speak Hindi and Punjabi. Um, I love that I know how to dance. Um, I love that I love mm -hmm. dancing. Um, and I do, I do really respect my parents for that humility. Um, because that is the reason, you know, that's the core of why I started, you know, what I started. Um, it came down to, you know, you know, my, my dad, he, he would, he'll help anyone and he won't, he won't, it's not about money, you know, it's where the heart mm -hmm. is it's about doing good and doing well for others. And with mm -hmm. that comes, comes good things. So, yeah. And, you know, when it, cause I just want to go back to the dancing part. Cause let me tell you, this woman can dance. Okay. And now to get into really the is speaking of all of these things, getting into the topic of mental health, you know, obviously we had something happen over the last few years called a, a pandemic and uh, it affected people in a lot of different ways. As a mental health professional, how did the pandemic impact what you do? How did it impact your desire to start a practice or, or just the way that you practice? So the pandemic definitely, um, it, it definitely did. I mean, either the pandemic in my, in my opinion, it either seemed to break people or make people. Um, I think, and that means families, couples, individuals. Um, I saw people who had to be home all the time together and they were never home. And all of a sudden now people are getting divorced or, I saw people then home together who were at home together and now they're having many babies or they're just they're just closer together. You know what I mean? Um, I think the pandemic, one of the biggest things was it, it really impacted kids so that that 2020 year, especially the transitional period from eighth to ninth grade and then the online schooling, um, which mm -hmm. then was thrown on teachers. And, you know, yes, of course, they're unprepared, like nobody's prepared for that. And so you know, kids not having to go to school and then being on school online and not really not being on school really because it kind of ended and then, you know, nobody, it was, a, it was chaotic. It was very chaotic for the kids. And those are the kids we're still, I'm seeing the repercussions of those that now, but we're going to continue to see that for at least uh, the next 10 years or so. So one of the things that I'm not surprised about at all, but that you have really made as kind of a priority, I think, of 
your practice, or at least maybe the way that you approach mental health and behavioral health, is that you're you're a very culturally competent person, and you incorporate a lot of DEI and just a lot of, you're very passionate about DEI, and you're passionate about working with underrepresented groups. Um, you know, I always think of you as someone who fights for the underdog in a, in a way. Um, and I'm just curious, can you tell us a little bit more about about the DEI focus um, and some of the roles that you hold now that, um, you know, that kind of further your DEI agenda? Yeah, for sure. So, um, well, so I went to Midwestern University in the suburbs of Chicago. So my training experience is Midwestern. Okay, so Midwestern has two campuses. One is here in Arizona and one is in Illinois. Um, and so my training experiences were completely diverse. I worked on the South side, West side of Chicago. Um, I worked in the underserved pop with the underserved kids, um, and adults, um, families and, and it just being from a different background and, um, diversity has always been, it's, it's always. First of all, the word diversity, though, I mean, the fact that it has to exist, I mean, can I, I just I always have to say that because I'm just like, I can't believe that we actually have to do that, but we have to do that. Um, and so it's been I have been I've I've um, I remember when 9-11 happened, um, my dad was a turban and, you know, from I, I went to pick, I went to Walgreens to pick up um, a prescription for him. And the uh, the guy at the counter was like, what? why are you why are you people doing this and i was like what did you say <laughs> and so me i you know i i was like get your manager here da, da, da. went home and told my parents the story who got mad at me because they're like why are you doing this like stop you know <laughs> um but i've always been um someone to stand up for that because it's not obviously it's not right right so it's led me so you know, I was president of the uh, Unity and Diversity Club when I was in high school. And so in moving to when I moved back here in 27, uh, 2016 um, to be licensed to Arizona, to, yeah, to Arizona as mm -hmm. a psychologist, um, I worked in multiple I worked in multiple um, settings. So one of the settings would be a school set. Uh, I worked at a therapeutic day school with kids. Um, who can't really make it in the regular public schools so they're sent to you know day schools where the emotional social emotional behavioral part um, supersedes the educational part because they need that to succeed in education and so just the being in arizona first and foremost and then just the different systems especially in arizona um, that i was constantly just like hitting a wall with constantly and so Though, uh, you know, call, let that be, you know, the police station, the fire, the fire, like who's going to transport the kid to the hospital, but they're not, they're taking them to juvie and this kid needs help. You know, he doesn't need to go to juvenile detention. He needs to go to the hospital. So, you know, these kinds of factors played a big role in it. Um, but ultimately, um, when I did start Aura, um, Midwestern University, the is like I said, it was it's here and in Illinois. Midwestern University created a alumni diversity council because students of Midwestern University approached um, the administrators and were like, "Hey, we want mentors that look like us." Um, so I was asked to be on this uh, council, which is comprised of twenty two people from both campuses, alumni um, from all different um, professions. So Midwestern is a healthcare organization or a healthcare school, I should say university. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I'm a psychologist, obviously. My vice president is a DO. We have uh, PTs, OTs, uh, dentists, pharmacy. So there's 22 of us across the United States. Um, and we initially, uh, we're, initially we were there to help mentor students that are currently attending um, Midwestern. And in this time, then we decided that we were gonna have officers um, and not just be a council. Um, and so I decided to run for president. So I am president now of Midwestern Congratulations. Alumni Diversity Council. Um, and like I said, so we do there, you know, it was created for the purposes of mentorship but I think that there's a lot more that needs to happen, especially with uh, DEI related initiatives. Um, and so between the Office of Alumni Relations and the newly formed DEI office at Midwestern, 
Um, I am pretty, I'm very actively involved in um, not just being the mentor for the students, but really trying to get from the top up and have that trickle down effect. So you know, I got myself a meeting with the deans and the chief academic officers and the president of the school and, um, you know, had a conversation and about how difficult it is to have these conversations about diversity and equity and inclusion and what that really means and how we have to take responsibility as educators to handle these issues when they come up in our respective colleges. There are so many diversity variables that providers, um, professionals, especially in healthcare, need to pay attention to. Um, their own biases, uh, the way that they uh, may interact with a patient differently based on their biases, which then creates mistrust in healthcare and disparities in healthcare. And that's where you see mm -hmm. all the things that are happening. Um, so that that the, the DEI part of me play a huge role in opening Aura because mm. people don't have access to healthcare. Um, so in opening Aura, I was going to be sure to take all insurances, including Medicare, Medicaid. I take some Medicaid plans, yes. And so the reason being is, especially with in Arizona, you don't see a lot of psychologists who take insurance. Uh, maybe they'll take not just in Arizona. This is this is a problem I think nationwide, where right. a lot of a lot of folks won't take insurance and they want people to pay out of pocket and people just can't afford that. And so, as you mentioned, there's a huge problem with access and who are the people that get left behind when when they ask for out of pocket costs. Right, exactly. And then you have the the systemic injustices, right, that mm -hmm. continue to happen and then it just keeps going and going and going. And so, you know, so that's where I was like, you know, we're, I, I, I'm going to create this. I'm going to create this group practice. I'm going to grow this group practice. Um, and I'm going to take all the insurances despite whatever headache I need to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. It's important for people to have that access for people to be able to get into the door, to be able to talk about their mental health. And then one of my biggest priorities also is to um, integrate m mental and physical health because there's no mental health without physical health and there's no physical health without mental health, period. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, one of the things that we do here at Aura for sure is communicate with the referring providers. So I'm building the bridges with the oncologists, with the primaries, with the neurologists, um, who everybody, everybody um, that will, who, or who does refer to me, uh, making connections with, um, with all of these other doctors, um, because that communication, that line of communication is crucial. Um, if I'm, mm -hmm. if, if an oncologist refers uh, a patient to me, they want to know the patient's mental health, that status, what, what's happening with them, what, what, what is their diagnosis like, because that is going to impact their treatment. It's going to inform their mm -hmm. treatment. So having these discussions and open dialogue with other providers is a huge thing that I did not really see in any of my education and training. And I think that's a huge way to kind of close that gap, but then also, again, provide that holistic care. Um, so, and so, and also, so in addition to the, for the DEI, um, part of me, um, I supervise students. So I, um, I love supervision. I supervise cl um, clinical psychology, doctoral students. Um, and so those students who work, um, under me, um, there are seeing patients under my license. They, you better believe that they are definitely <laughs> going to have to point out what their biases are in group supervision, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to in, in individual and group supervision because I want to produce you know, professionals who are competent, culturally competent, mm -hmm. um, I, and I and I want them to be aware of the way that they interact with patients so that we can start to decrease this mistrust in healthcare and decrease the disparity that's happening everywhere. Um, so D is huge for me. So, you know, it, it, and, and I definitely, one of my main goals is actually to also make aura, um, I want to make it a, a diversity kind of a hub, not a hub, but like, I'm, I want to focus on diversity a lot here. Um, so yeah. I have the students that will be starting with me come August, will be having biweekly diversity trainings led by different people. And, um, I don't even care what they talk about. I love that diversity. They're there. It's mandatory. They have to do it. It's part of their hours that they have here with me. 
Um, that is so great. You know, as you mentioned, a lot of that didn't happen in, in your school training, right? And so to be able to get that in practice is just invaluable. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Thank you for having me, Diana. Thank you for having me. I love it. This was great. Yeah.